What's popular YouTube? Another day, another shameless ad plug on Thorin's channel. Gamersops, the delicious energy formula I'm always telling you guys about, has a new flavor, white grapefruit. It's juicy, but with a mildly sour taste, kind of like Cadian's career story in Heroic. Now, it's not the kind of beverage you'll be served by beautiful Danish air hostesses flying high, but stop making this all about Cadian and shush for a moment so I can tell you about this outstanding offer. You can get 10% off with the code THORIN, T-H-O-R-I-N, at gamersups.gg. Well, that's enough jibber-jabbying for me. Let's talk about why this video exists. So, Cadian is perhaps the best in-game leader in CSGO. I think I might actually pick him right now. Unarguably, the best team in CSGO. Sure, Vitality's won a few events, but actually they've just changed players. He Rock hasn't. On... Let's be real, every day that isn't a semi in a final, I think they probably are the best team in the world, Heroic. Way less likely to go out early in a competition than any other squad in the world, including G2 and Vitality. And he is one of the best entertainers and personalities in the game as well. He's actually amazing at making that aspect of the game interesting for fans and casuals and playing up to the crowd and using a camera after he wins, etc., He's actually a player slash figure that I have a lot of affection for and has a phenomenal career story. Easy candidate, by the way, for a real like movie, like a Hollywood movie. But therein lies one of my biggest issues with him. I think he has main character syndrome. And this is actually my narrative. I crafted this all the way back in like December of 2022 when he failed that I am Rio major. I pointed out on hot take point made. Now, fair play. Maui took that point. It's a good point. He agreed with it, ran with it, used it on desks. I'm not on the desks. So it's somewhat credited to him and people flame him for it. But this is absolutely a take I stand by. And I think there's a lot to it. And actually, it outlines the fact that he would be the perfect movie candidate. Outlines a lot of the problems Heroic faces right now. So Cadian's story is an incredible one. It's very inspirational. It's so unlikely. It's so epic. It's got so many twists and turns and seemingly a really satisfying sort of ending or third act because he starts as a journeyman, a hated journeyman, where there was even like a, a Facebook group in Source that was like the fuck Cadian group and every Danish player was supposed to be in it. He had to go elsewhere to foreign teams, Mouse and all this other stuff early on. They're later on playing like Rogue and all this. He was in all these other squads just grinding away, trying to make it. Never had any interest from the TSMs the top, top teams in the world, the Astralises, etc. He was an AWPA, a primary AWPA, probably the hardest role in the game to be a star in, since you only have one per team. It's an expensive gun. And in his country, early on, there was Nico with a C from Western Wolves. Then there was Cajun B in TSM. Then there was Device, potentially the goat of the game in Astralis. So you're not getting any of those spots. You're not going to be better than those players, in theory. Then he becomes an in-game leader, one of the other hardest roles in the game to play, because there's also only one. You get blamed for all the failures, and you often, like, he has now, don't always work with the absolute best talents, shout out my boy Carrigan and Alexi B and MSL so initially he was a whatever in game leader when he was first doing it in North, it was just that, it was aight it wasn't anything special, then people forget in 2020 when he was initially in Iraq, he was under Snappy a much more veteran in game leader then though he took over from Snappy he becomes good at the role, winning and I mean, let's be real. He wasn't just winning tournaments. He was This team was world number one in the online area in 2020. And that was when they had Borup and Nico, by the way. That wasn't the lineup you think of now. He had his team in position to be, I would say, if not the most, arguably the most consistent team of the post-online era, when everyone assumed they were onliners because how they played then, and the fact that he never done anything big online himself. This is a team that could have been in the Stockholm Major Final if Nico hadn't gone god mode with a rifle on Infernal that third map. They could have been in the Antwerp semis, I would even say final, if they'd have closed out that game against Na'Vi where it was looking so good and he was even playing well himself. They could have won the IEM Rio Major, for real. I thought once Na'Vi was eliminated, they were actually the favourites. They could have been in the finals or won Blast Paris, the last CSGO Major, they just blew it against Game of Legion. They have won two Blast titles under his leadership, both times beating elite teams, FaZe Clan for the Fall Finals Team of the Year, and obviously Vitality right now was the number one team in the world and the major champions. He did it all without a top five player in the world, and I would say zero top 10 or top 20 players of all time at this point in time, and maybe ever. And he did it all while orping himself and in-game leading. That's part of the problem, though. I think... 
like this movie I just laid out there of all the incredible things. I think he buys into his own career story too much. It's like he thinks, and this is a, li a line I've used many times, it's like he thinks he's in the biopic, the Hollywood biopic of his life, like Cadian, an underdog story. And he's trying to use artistic license to make each scene better, except this is real life, not the Hollywood movie. It's not using artistic license. Like You're just actually trying to sort of oversex what the current storyline is instead of just winning the game. So in terms of his in-game leader, let's start there. I actually think this is one area I used to be a little bit more critical. I actually think he's very good now. But uh, even there... His team seems mega reliant on his calling and his mid-rounding and his choice of where they do clauses, etc. Reminds me actually of Carrigan, and obviously as a person I give a lot of credit to for that style. But the problem is this, Carrigan does that style and has the most success when he has really skilled players, star-level players, and ones that have experience to close things out themselves. So he doesn't always have to make the genius call. They can also win the round. I feel like Kadian doesn't have those players. And so essentially, if it ever goes to shit on T-side and his calls don't work, or he loses his feel for a moment, or he gets under pressure, then yeah, you know what? It just goes to shit. And the team suddenly goes from the best T-side team in the world to just average. I mean, that Kadavitia kind of final versus G2, you go and look on paper, you go, oh, this wasn't very competitive. His team's leading on like every game, a bunch of times on T-side, and they just throw it all away. They're just not able to capitalize upon it. Then, I've got to say this, if he's the IGL, and I'm viewing him in that role, well, the fact that he orps while IGLing, but isn't actually a good enough orper to be like a true top five one in the world, in my opinion, or elite orper, that means I have to take some points away from him as IGL, that he keeps calling his own number and calling for the orp, right? Because he seems, quite frankly, to call around himself at certain key points of games on CT and T. Like, they have some very good setups and set pieces in Heroic. So what, what's even brilliant is they don't spam them too much. But they all seem to revolve around his op and him getting the pick and him being the one to kill simple and him being the one to do this and him being the one to get this. So it's like, bro, I get that you're the opera, but you're not that opera. You aren't him when it comes to the op. That's the problem. As an IGL, you are. But you as the IGL is countering you as the player in this particular sense. I mean, the joke there is that used to be a similar thing, but the other way around with Nico. Nico, the player, was unbelievably good, but then Nico, the IGL, was taken away from Nico, the player. So it just shows how interesting it works when people try to be the star in the IGL. Then let's talk about his open, right? Because I do actually have my criticisms here, as people will know. He's actually, I will say, better than I thought he was when we first came back to LAN. Like, I didn't give him the credit for how good he actually is. I thought he was just an average tier one opera, but he is above average. He isn't elite, though, and he never will be. I think he comes nowhere close to Zewu, Simple, Shiro, Device, if he gets back to his top level. He's comparable, I would say, to Jim. And by the way, how many big files do you see Jim in nowadays? How, many, how often does he go deep even with a good roster? Although obviously stylistically massively different, but they're also both IGLs. In my opinion, a big part of their game, quite frankly, is calling around themselves at times. Imagine if Cadian could be on a rifle, call the same way, and had Device as his opera. And we're just talking about winning absolutely everything and having an era and dynasty and, and going for the greatest team of all time. Wouldn't that just fix so many things about this team? But no, it has to be Cadian, right? Now, I always make this point when it comes to stats that for me, the king stat is kills per round for star players. And this is the key, and for entries. The key thing here is this. If you look at the rest of the setup of the team, they're in a good team, it's not super flawed, etc. If you're the AWPA and you want to be in the best team in the world, you probably need to be in contention for best AWPA in the world. That's usually the way it works. That's why Team Liquid 2019 is so incredible that we're trying to do it the unusual way. So look at his ratings in 2023. Okay, the ratings all look good. It's a lot above 1.10. But look at the king kills per round. Only one time the entire year, it was at the major, has he gotten over 0 0.7 kills per round? He's the AWPA with the best and the most expensive gun in the game. And his team's winning loads of these games. Yeah, sure, if you go down, like if you round up, these all become 0 0.7, right? One, two, three, four, five. Depends how generous we are, but if you round that up, yeah, a bunch of them go to 0 0.7. But it's, it's never going much above, though. Like the best is 0 0.71. Most of them 0 0.68, 0 0.69. He's not having those 0 0.8 performances of the z -woos and the she -roos. He's not having the 0 0.75, and that's an average tournament. This is the best case scenario. And by the way, notice how... This is the point to be made. The Opa, in theory, the stat that he can farm the easiest in a top team where you're winning loads of games, especially if you're a team that's good on both sides of the game, is the kill-death differential. 
That's the one, the plus minus. This is the one that he can just farm like a more for because obviously you kill people, you've got the instant one-click weapon, and you're not doing that like I do three bullets, I did 99 damage, but I died, so I don't get the kill as the, as the rifler. And so normally you can also play a bit more passive and you can keep your deaths really low. And so as a result, you're having those Inferno games where you go 21 to 6 and you've got a mad differential. Where's he having those, by the way? Like, look, his best one was the Major. He's plus 41 on 11 maps. At this one, in this one, he's in the quarters, a bunch of series, plus 27. There's a bunch of tournaments here where he comes second. He's in the, like this one's an RMR, but this is an actual real tournament. He comes second with a plus six for the entire event over 16 maps. He's just not good enough to be the best stopper in the best team of the world. And that is a problem, in my opinion. You can go back to 2022. It's the same story. You go to 2022. These are just like, whatever. He even wins this tournament, by the way, with a minus three. Because it was incredibly close, the one against FaZe Clan. You go look at the Major, yeah, it's good, plus 32. Actually got outperformed by Jim at that event. Go look here, wow, what a great performance. 9th to 12th, 15 maps, plus 64. It's one of his best performances ever, by the way. But even then, that's about what you'd want the average to be. And it isn't what his average is. So you look, it doesn't matter what they do in this team. It's, it's just not happening. So one of the reasons I can't handle him being the primary opera, if you want them to be the absolute best team, and I think it inhibits him as the IGL, is it's an expensive gun to cost your team economy. You die in, in some of these scenarios, but without getting tons of kills, so you're not getting that much value. Remember, it only has a 100 kill reward. Need saving, so it's already a save meta for CT, so they're going to be giving up loads of rounds and saving you the AWP and doing stupid rounds, like I see, where they save him the AWP, sometimes on T-side. Then a couple of them have pistols, like Deagles and Tech Nines, and he's just got an AWP trying to pick everyone. It's like, you aren't Kenny S, mate. You aren't Simple. You aren't Zebu. You aren't those players that can hard force. Even Device didn't use to AWP like that on Astralis. That's an abusive style of AWPing. Device would just T-side rifle on Inferno, their best map, so that the team could work around the way the tactics worked. Not it all be about him and the AWP and setting him up. And the AWP on T-side needs setup. It needs utility to be used for it. The irony of this, by the way, is Cadian is one of the best in the game at using utility himself. So, bro, you can't be the one throwing it for yourself and open. Like, you just do the utility and have a great AWP. Maybe you could make, like, a call the fucking fifth best AWP in the world if you had him and you had your util and your setup and your calling. Then there's obviously the meat of this video, right? Which is making the play, right? The best example was at this major. It's one of the reasons this team wasn't in the final. They won the first map against Gamer Legion. Massive underdog, by the way. Then on the second map, Inferno, they do this crazy comeback into the game and they have the chance on the 30th round to make it OT. And I'll tell you, if you know the way underdogs are, if you get them to OT off that scenario, they're the ones psychologically wrecked. You just beat them on that OT and you win 2-0, you go in the final and they have a sob story, but at the time they almost got to the third map and would have won. So you're on the 30th round, his team is 3v2 with him alive on CT side, Inferno, and he is in the B-bomb site behind Coffins over to Towards construction side, there is no bomb down yet. The T's are going into B, the two T's. One of them, Imma, Imma, is on the site, not planted yet. The other one, Isaac, is back over in the banana, and he has two teammates already rotated from CT, one already into the site, one coming uh, from CT spawn. And as a result, you just wait. And are you ready? There's zero utility for Game Legion. They can't even, like, smoke off, block the guys coming from CT. In that scenario, you just sit there, you wait, you force Immer to plant, or Isaac to cross. And in that scenario, you win this round so many times and go to OT. But because it was the big round for OT, and this was a major semi-final, and this is an underdog team, what does Cadian do? Does he wait? No, no. Cadian just dry peeks into Isaac from memory. It was in the banana, the one that coming from the banana. As Immer's about to plant, dies, and off of that, Gamer Legion wins the game as a 2v2. He could have waited for the rotations. He could have waited for teammates to lock Immer in, like I say. But he tries to make the iconic play. Gives up the advantage, the round, and the chance at OT. They lose the map. They go to the third map. They get smashed on that one because of a complete breakdown. That's why I've often called this a vanity project, not in terms of overall team, but in terms of Cadian's sort of seeming approach to the team. Then there's the whole thing of why you all love him for what he does on camera, right? The speech. The problem is he plays way too much to the cameras and that biopic angle of like, this will be so epic later when we win. 
those speeches, like, yeah, there's great ones in movies any given Sunday. Like, you got to fight for those inches. Win one for the Gipper, lads. Like, yeah, we get it. Those are iconic. But you notice there's only one or two of those. There's not like a guy that's like, yeah, and then he gave his 50th epic speech and we won that game too. He spams them way too much. I can tell you this is a problem Taz used to have back in the 1.6 with his great team that won loads of majors. They told me, some of his teammates, because we knew he'd do this epic speech, not only did we nickname him the general, but we sort of tuned out for some of them. Sometimes we're like, whatever, get your speech on over with let's just play a count strike shall we and that's the problem he spams it every match every big match every final and where are the results how does this make them win these big championships do they come through do they believe in themselves and you fought for me and guys i was back in 2014 look if you do that once that might do something when you do it this many times people tune you out they aren't thinking about that in the game they're thinking about the game when they're in the game mate that's the thing that's so silly. And also, not only does it not have the desired effect, based on the great players in different sports I've read biographies of, sometimes even talked to all the people I've known in esports, it's actually the opposite approach that yields the biggest results. If you ask someone like a Kobe Bryant why he hits the last second shot, it's not because he gave himself a speech and thought about as a boy what it meant and being against the Jazz in 1997 and all the air balls and the fact that, like, I'm the best player, it's my time. Like, no, no, he says the opposite. He says what you do is you reduce it down to the basics of, like, I'm going to take a shot that I've practiced tens of thousands of times over and over. I've done it in many, many games. It's just a regular shot to me. I can hit it loads of the time. I'm just going to get to my spot, take the shot. That's it. I'm not thinking about the fact it's the game-winning shot. Everything's on my shoulders. I'm not thinking about any of that. I'm reducing it down to the simplest aspects so there isn't pressure as a result. Pressure is just a psychological component the others are all thinking about, but I've removed it. No, no, he doesn't do that. So to me, the actual speeches, if you want to have success here, would be like, look, we don't have to be heroes. We don't have to do anything special because we're prepared. We beat this team in practice. We are the better team. We have the map pool over them. So we'll win even if they win our map. We have the tactics over them. We can get out of trouble even if they have the best player. They might even have a superstar like Zemo. Well, simple. It doesn't matter. We have the roles. We have the players. We have the complete team. We're going to win. We don't need to do anything flashy, guys. Just be yourselves. Anytime you don't get lost in the crowd, the pressure, just remember who we are. We're heroic. Remember the team we are in practice every day of our lives. Just play like that. You don't need to do anything. It's no big deal. No, no. He makes it the opposite. He builds the pressure up to here. And maybe he likes that. I don't think some of his teammates do though and that leads to another aspect which I'm quite critical of which is when he tries to trash talk other teams or on stage in the crowd and be the heel I think that works for him because he actually tends to perform quite good out of a lot of his teammates in the arena I think people like the obvious one Stown if he hadn't got Yabby in, who does seem to actually have some clutch factor, man, this team would, would throw even more big matches. Because I think it hurts his teammates and his team at times when he does that trash talking. Especially, by the way, not only the pressure he's putting on them, but when the crowd goes hard against them. That's when this team doesn't win. Like, he almost blew that Furia series at the IM Rio Major, where Furia had no business even winning that and going to the final. They managed to beat them, but he almost blew it. They were coming right back into that thing. The crowd was completely against him, no matter how much he'd bigged up Brazil in all the interviews. Then there's the Outsiders final of the major. In theory, in this scenario, right, because you just beat Fury, yeah, it's a bit whatever, the crowd isn't necessarily going to pull for you. In the big pressure of the moment, of like, oh, gonna win it. any big speech, it's just whack. That was so whack, the way that final went. And that was the most winnable major in a long time, by the way. Then how about before that, when we first came back to LAN, after the Stockholm Major, where you've almost made the finals, you're easily the best Danish team, when he did that trash talk against Astralis, and they had the Blast 4 finals, where he got, he got booed by all the crowd, and they got wrecked in like a, what should have been an easy win for them against the Astralis team with Blame F and Config. And then he did that trash talk about how like the, match, the next match is like for all the marbles, and, and so... Whoever loses it, like, this is the one that's going to give bragging rights for years. And not only did they lose the match, but the dumbest thing is, the concept sounds great if you're willing to live up to what happens. But why why gamble it? Because in this scenario, you're the better team. Even if they win this match, you're going to be the better team going forwards. You were the better team. You are the better team. You don't have to give them that. That's like you being the guy who has bazillions of dollars and just going, you know what? We're going to play some version of Texas No Limit Hold'em. It doesn't even exist. It's in No Limit Hold'em. If you have $100 and I have 10000 and you go all in, you can only win 100 of mine. That's like if Cadian said, new rule, we'll just both go all in. You've got 100 I've got 10000 But if you win, you just get my 10000 and I can only win your 100 what a silly angle that was. Like, I appreciate it for the showmanship, but I think what it did to his team and what it did to, like, actually the fan understanding of the game was so silly. Like, I don't think he executed that trash talk very well. Notice that a rare win that he's had in his career, guys, 
was against Fears at the Blast 4 finals when they were in the Royal Arena. Now they had the Danish crowd on their side. There's only Carrigan on the other side. And that's when they won narrowly. What about this other tournament they won this last spring? Oh, you mean the one where Vitality's got the post-major hangover? And yeah, you call a great game. It's sort of neutral crowd at that point in time, right? I think this heel angle doesn't work. I think it actually puts too much pressure on his teammates. I don't think they respond very well to the crowd going hard against them. I've never thought the crowd makes you better. I think the crowd can make the opponent worse, though, if they've got any mental weakness. Then let's just say it right now. He had an amazing window to win a major, particularly that one after Furia beat Na'Vi and Mouse beat Cloud9, and the only teams left is going to be Heroic against Furia and Outsiders versus Pro against Mouse. You're supposed to win that tournament right there if you're Heroic. You're the odds-on favourite. Every aspect goes in your favour, except why did I pick Outsiders to beat them? Because the clutch fact is sure as hell doesn't go, against, go in your favour. It goes against you. And if it has to go to a late game, which is what Outsiders was great at forcing, you're going to fuck up and you're going to have that moment where you let yourself down. So my problem, I can summarise at this, is the in-game leader. It's in the title, mate. Leader. You lead the team to victory. You aren't the main reason for the victory. You don't win it for them. Your players win the game for you. Now, if you're the Opa, you are, in theory, supposed to be the best player, so you're going to have to do a lot of the heavy lifting. This is my issue. Is that he's not quite a good enough Opa and he's an extremely good IGL, but then the whole ego and the angle and the storyline and, and, and look, I get it. You are living out your dream. But how about let's face the reality as well? And by the way, I'll just say this now. This whole angle that like winning the blasts makes up for the majors you didn't win. It doesn't. All tournaments aren't created equal. They're not even prestige events like majors are. And it absolutely is not like... If you could trade right now, you'd trade both blasts for one major. Let's be absolutely real. And this whole thing they tried at like the this last tournament blast of like self jinxing like oh we lose every game now we're not even going to make semis off I was like that's so whack no one ever even said that that was some silly thing where we were like you're so good why would you ever lose to bombs you're like, well, I guess we just can't win against anyone we've got to be the underdog if you're actually the best team and the best IGL of all time you don't want to be the underdog you should be the favourite all the time and then win as the favourite that's what the greatest of all time do my mate so the problem with this whole story is I have so much affection for this guy. He is actually the main reason why this team's done so much. He is him in this team. And I admire his story a lot, but that's also the problem is I want him to win everything. I want him to be number one. I want him to win multiple majors. This to be his era in Heroic or going to CS2 was the best. It's a bit like when Team Liquid had that run in 2019 with Nitro and Elysian. I wanted them to overtake Astralis and do it and reach for the absolute heights of the game and do it in an impossible way. The problem is it just isn't happening and it doesn't look like it's gonna happen and so I don't know what you do right now because they're in such a good position but when I look at it I do think this is one of the factors that plays against Heroic and KD and himself sometimes I've been pleasantly surprised during the time I've had my Patreon and my Patreon community the Skrilluminati by both the financial support they've provided and the moral support. And so this video was kindly supported and made possible by Starlust, Theo Buenzelli, Ahmed Haju, Matt Pognaccio Racula, Toucan, Jensen Go, Animosity, Tobias Bernasconi, Bot Pounder 420, Yurka 86, Tosh, and as always, you know it, a special thanks goes out to my main man, Jerky's Minion. Would you like to ask a question in one of those AMAs where I tend to go pretty in depth? Sometimes they even spin out into their own videos. Do you want teasers to find out who the upcoming guests are for the myriad of interviews that I do across esports? Maybe you want to suggest a topic or a guest. We have a channel on my Discord where you can do that if you're at the right tier. And of course, you could potentially take part in one of those lengthy esports discussions discussions will be about whatever is on your mind in the scene. Well, if any of those perks sound tantalizing, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today via the Patreon link in the description box below.